We're going to start by reading from Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2, if you've got your Bible. And then after that, uh, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. Amen. So it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is one of my, my favorite scriptures. And then we'll turn to 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, which says, Do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but one receives the prize? Yeah. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. And bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. So you might notice a theme between these two verses. We're talking about a race. Yeah. A race. And this morning we're going to talk about racing for reward. Amen. Amen. How many people here like roller coasters? Hands up if you like roller coasters. Okay, okay. I know who my crazy people are. Who here does not like roller coasters? Okay, okay, there's, there's the same people. For me, I hate roller coasters. I don't like roller coasters at all. They scare me because they're designed to scare people. And it works for me. I, I don't like hanging on for dear life as I'm being whipped around on a, a roller coaster at 100 miles per hour up, you know, and then down and dropping. And, oh, there's a roller coaster going on behind me. It's, it's scary to me. I don't, I don't like it all that much. Now, I haven't been on a roller coaster in years at this point. Um, and I probably could be convinced to go on a roller coaster again. I could probably be peer pressured, you know, into going onto a roller coaster, but I wouldn't enjoy it. I wouldn't enjoy it. And I remember when I was about 12 years old or so, my family was at an amusement park. I don't know if I was 12 years old. I'm not sure. When did we go to Branson? Do you know? I was probably around 12 or 13. I'm hoping I was 12. We'll go with a younger age. 12. I was eight. <laughs> I don't know how old I was. We'll say, we'll say 12. And we're at Silver Dollar City in Branson. And I'd gone on a couple of the small rides, and I was fine with that. Everything was all cool, you know. We went on the kids' rides and the teacups and whatever else, and everything was going okay. And then my family said to me, Sam, you have to try at least one of the big rides. And I said, nope, no way. I'm not interested. I'm not going on one of the big rides. And my mom said, if you go on a big ride... <laughs> I'll buy you a funnel cake. <laughs> now this statement, it captured young Sam's interest. At this time, I was a pretty hefty kid, very keen on eating. Yeah. And so I said, let's do this. So I went and I got in the line for the Thunderation. This was not the biggest ride in the park, but I don't know, maybe second or third, maybe third or fourth, I'm not sure. And it was certainly the largest I had been on up until that point. And I remember standing in line, which was about 20 minutes long, and the closer I got to my turn to get on this thing, the more apprehensive I became. And I had these sunglasses on, and you know, I found the sunglasses in my room this morning, so I'm going to put it on for the visual effect. These are pretty cool sunglasses, eh? <laughs> Craig would probably call them my dad's sunglasses, but, but I, I was standing in line, and underneath these sunglasses that I wear right now, <laughs> tears began to fill my eyes. <laughs> and I remember just standing next to my dad and thinking, why am I going on this ride? And I, I was crying, and my younger sister, you know, Jazz, she was, she was jumping for joy, all excited to go on the Thunderation, and I'm just crying away. But one thing kept me in that line. The funnel cake on the other side. And so, so I'm, sta I'm standing in the line for this ride, and I, I, remember, I remember being strapped into the roller coaster, and my dad's next to me, and I, I'm so scared, I'm crying, and I remember my final words being, I don't want to do this! And then we shoot off. I don't know if the sunglasses stayed on, I'm assuming they did since I still have them, but I was, I was scared for my life. They were doing loops and turns and corkscrews, and I don't even know if I hardly opened my eyes. I just sat through, braved the storm. And when we finally came to a halt and were released, I excitedly jumped out of my seat and ran over to where my mom was holding the funnel cake as promised. And man, that funnel cake was good. I tell you this story to say this. There's going to be times in your life where you've got to endure some hardships. Right. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to stretch your faith. You're going to have to get on the potter's wheel. 
But let me make one thing clear. You're not going through it all for no reason. Right. You're not having your faith tested because God wants you to break under pressure. But rather, let me tell you that God is bringing you through the storm because yeah. there is reward on the other side. You're going through the fire to make some gold. You're going through some pressure because there's diamonds on the other side. You've got some trials happening in your life right now. You might be on the roller coaster of life, but there's a funnel cake on the other side. <laughs> Just the other day, I believe it was, it was Friday, I was, I was doing a workout on the stationary bike in my house. And I haven't biked in months. And I chose pretty much the hardest workout on YouTube that I could find. And during this workout, I got to a point where I just felt like giving up. My legs are screaming in agony. I wanted to quit pedaling. I, I felt like I was going to throw up. Like, it was, it was bad. And I was just about ready to hop off my bike. And then the trainer said, pain is temporary. Quitting is forever. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to finish this workout. And so I gave everything I had left in the tank. And, and we started to ramp up. And they said, okay, now give 10 out of 10 effort. And I'm pedaling away. And my legs were screaming. It was a painful workout. But I got through because that, that quote stuck out to me. You know, pain is temporary. But quitting is forever. If you make that decision, you don't get to bring it back. You don't get to hop on that bike the next day and say, okay, now I'll finish that last 10 minutes of the workout. No, there's reward on the other side. You go through the pain, but the pain does subside. And I'm standing here today. I'm able to walk. I'm still okay. I made it through the workout. And James 1 and 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James makes it clear to the churches in his greeting, Listen, I know you're going through some things right now, but count it all joy. God isn't trying to punish you, but he's testing you to produce something in your life. Yes. You're not complete yet, but allow yourself to go through this, and you won't lack anything. I know I'm talking to some people here today who are going through some things. Anyone going through something in, the, in this, the, this place this morning? You might feel like you're, you're strapped in a roller coaster right now, and you don't know where you're headed, and you feel like the enemy is just jerking you around wherever, wherever he wants to, to put you. But let me bring you a word of encouragement today. And tell you that you are racing for reward. Right. You're going through this all for a reason. It's not for no purpose. When the spiritual attacks start to amp up, you know that there's victory on the way. Yeah. You know that when the enemy's trying out some new tactics, it's because he sees strength. Right. He's trying to cut you down. But if you be patient, you're going to come out on the other side with a reward. Yes. Paul talks about running the race in our text passage. Hebrews 12. He says, let us lay aside every way mm -hmm. and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us right. looking unto jesus now i come to you today with some running experience anyone else a runner in the house today we got we got a few people if you've run ran at some point in your life you're allowed to raise your hand okay great yeah now we got a lot more runners so if, if any of you have ever ever ran before you're gonna know that when you go into a race you've got to be light you can, you can carbo-load the day before. You can have your pasta and your, your pizza and your bread and whatever, whatever else you want the day before. But when it's the day of the race, you're not going to Golden Corral and eating as much food as you possibly can. <laughs> no, you're going to keep a light stomach. And you're not going to go to the race wearing jeans and snow pants over the top of that and steel-toed boots and a construction helmet and a parka over top. But no, you're going to go in with the lightest amount of clothes that you can possibly go with. And I remember back in my cross-country days, we were given these shoes that were called spikes. And they were like the lightest things that you could wear on your feet. They basically made, made you feel like you were running barefoot. You wore your lightest shirt. I would wear a, a light pair of running pants. And most of my competitors would be wearing these, these shorts that were about like that long. You know, <laughs> they barely covered anything. I, I would wear a little, something a little bit more modest than that. But you wanted to be light on the day of a race. Now, what's true to the natural, yeah. it's true to the spiritual. Yeah, it is. We should not be going into the race to heaven with as much weight as we can possibly carry. Right. Psalms 55 and 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Another translation says, He shall not permit the righteous to stumble. You might have come into this place with burdens today. You might feel like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders, but I've got news. God can take that weight away today. Yeah. And Paul tells us exactly what kind of weight he's talking about because he goes on to say the sin which so easily ensnares us. Yeah. Yeah. 
And let me tell you that the cycle of sin and shame in your life is the heaviest thing that you can carry. And God, God wants to take that away from you this morning. Right. You might have started a behavior when you were young, maybe, maybe just 12 or 13 years old, and maybe you've been relying on substances or, or entertainment, or maybe you've been thinking a certain way for a long time. Maybe you struggle with your, your anger and you lash out. Maybe you have difficulty with telling the truth. And you keep digging yourself a deeper and deeper grave because every time you try to stop those behaviors, you end up messing up again. Right. And you know, you just hate yourself more and more every time. But the Bible says that there's pleasure in sin just for a season. Right. Everything was probably okay for a while. You know, maybe you even felt good behaving a certain way for a bit. But the wages of sin is death. Yeah. And that's heavy to carry. It's very heavy to carry. And the pleasure of sin, it becomes meaningless after a while. Right. And if you can relate it all to what I'm saying here today, let me tell you that, that there is hope. There is hope for you today. Yeah. You can lay down that burden at the foot of Jesus. You can lay it down at the cross and know that he will take it away. I've cast some things on Jesus. I've gone yeah. to God and I've said, cut some things out of my life that need to be cut out. Remove what you've got to remove. Psalms 103 and, and 12 says, as far as the east is yeah. from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Right. That word transgressions, that's our sin. David is writing here as a man who he's experienced the consequences of sin. He's writing him as a man who has caused a woman to commit adultery on her husband and then caused her husband to be killed. It was an atrocious action. Yeah. Absolutely wicked behavior. But the same David, he went to God and he wept. Yeah. In Psalm 51, David cries out and says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Yes, Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Right. Do not cast me out of your presence and do not take your spirit from me. Restore to me. The joy of my salvation. Yes. And I don't know who I'm talking to here today, but if you're feeling weary, if you're feeling weighed down, Thanks. if this race is beginning to feel like it's never going to end, let me tell you, lay down that weight. Yes. Experience the joy of salvation. Get into the presence of God and be reminded why you started running. Right. There's a reward on the other side. Yeah. If you just endure to the end, you'll reach that goal. Thanks. The second thing I'll tell you about racing is that you've got to be focused on the finish line. Before I get to that, let me just tell you that you've got to pace yourself. Yeah. Far too often, I see people enter the church going a million miles an hour, and they fizzle out in a couple weeks. Yeah. Listen, you're not going to understand everything at once. No. You've got to continually grow in the Word of God. I don't have all the answers. Pastor Craig doesn't have all the answers. Pastor Abbott is still growing. Pastor Kingsley is still, still growing. And I'm not saying this to bring our leaders down, but rather to say everyone is still moving, yeah. pressing towards yeah. the mark, moving towards the finish line. We're all growing. And in fact, I think it's more of a compliment for these men of God that they're continually growing in their faith. They're seeking the word of God daily. They're, they're trying to make themselves available to hear his voice. And this is not a sprint to heaven. You know, the gun doesn't go off and you run as fast as you can for 10 seconds and then, then you're finished. No, this is more of a, a marathon. Right. Now, I, I personally have only uh, officially raced 10 kilometers. And the furthest distance I've done in training is 22 kilometers. And the most I've done this year is 18 and a half. And let me tell you that when you've, you're headed off to long runs, you really have to keep your pace. And I've been guilty in races before of giving way too much off the start. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I like in a race to claim the lead off the start, but I'm not fast enough to keep the lead for the entire race. And in our walk with God in this race, yeah. we don't have to rush to be the best right off the start. When a new convert comes in and is filled with the Holy Ghost, we don't say, all right, get up there and preach. Go get up. <laughs> no, no, we give them a little bit of time. Right. And that's not to say that they won't ever preach or sing exactly. or teach Sunday school or greet or do anything else in the kingdom. But we want to make sure that they put down roots first. Yeah. There's an important element of Jesus' ministry that really is what established the church, and that was discipleship. Right. Jesus' disciples were young men who were completely untrained. And then they spent several years with Jesus before even being given an opportunity to begin their own ministry. Right. Jesus taught, and he trained them carefully. He spent time with them constantly. And it's an example for us to follow. Ministry takes time. It takes investment. It takes growth, and it takes sacrifice. Yeah. Now, that's a side note on my second point, which is that our focus in this race has to be forward. I remember one race back in high school where I was competing for a spot in the provincial race, in OFSA. And in this race, you had to be one of the top four teams, and you had to be one of the top four runners on your team to qualify. 
Now, I was at the level where I was about the fourth or fifth fastest runner on my team, and I was in a certain zone where this race, it, it really mattered. So we got going, and I was having a good race. I was actually in third place on my team. I was holding a good pace. Everything was going as it should. Um, and uh, I, I was already starting to celebrate in my head. You know, I was thinking, okay, I've, I've got this locked in. I'm going gonna, gonna to make it. Even if I drop one spot, I'm still going to be headed to provincials. And then we got to the fourth kilometer out of the five-kilometer race. And at this point, everything is still, still good. I'm still in third place. Things are going well. But my, two, my shoe began to come untied. And I began to focus on my shoe. And I was mentally starting to check out of the race. And I made the worst mistake a runner can possibly make in a race. And I knelt down and I tied my shoe. And during this time, obviously, I was not still moving. I was not running along and tying my shoe. But I knelt down and I only stopped for maybe about 20 seconds, however long it took me to, to tie my shoe. And during this time, my two teammates passed me. Yeah. And suddenly I was in fifth place, one place short of the qualifying spot. And we've only got about 800 meters to go. And I'm trying to give everything I have left in the tank just to, to catch one of these guys. And I got close to the finish line within 100 meters, and it's me and this guy right next to each other. And we're sprinting, giving everything we've got at the finish line. And he stepped across just one second before me. And it even I went, I went and I looked at the, the, the sheet after, and I was like, was it as close as I felt? And it just says on the sheet, one second difference between me and him. And I thought to myself, if I hadn't, stopped running and I remember my coach after the race saying to me Sam what happened I saw you I saw you 800 meters from the the finish line and you were in third place on the team what happened I said coach I stopped to tie my shoe and his words stuck with me he said Sam never stop in a race especially so close to the finish line just minutes away from the finish line and this distraction had become so bothersome to me that I stopped doing the one thing that I should have been doing which was moving forward and Paul asks us in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Yeah. Listen to me, church, when I tell you that you've got to run in a way to obtain the prize. Yeah. The devil's going to try to throw some things at you. Yeah. You're going to be running in the race and he says, well, look over there. Right. Look what they're doing. Yeah. They're not running the same way as you. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, is all this sacrifice really worth it? Or, or you may be distracted by things like health issues and, and family. And you may get so caught up with work that your prayer life starts to slip. And maybe you're in this room today and you used to fast regularly, but things have changed. Life has gotten busy. You need that energy. You used to pray every morning, but you've got kids to get to school. And you've got a job that starts early. And you used to keep your screen time low, but I mean, come on, it's my me time. It's my time to just relax. Now, I'm not saying this in ignorance, but I know how life can be. And nor am I claiming that I'm not sometimes guilty of the same things, but these little innocent distractions, they can cost you. I've seen people get so involved with their kids' sport team that they can't make it out to Sunday church. Yeah. I've seen families move to a city without a church because of a job opportunity. I've seen people get jobs that won't allow them to have Sundays off because of an increased pay grade. And we're running in this race church, and you better believe that I intend to receive the prize. Yeah. And I wonder if there's anyone else in this room today that says, I'm running to receive the prize. I'm racing for reward. There's going to be distractions along the way, but I'm keeping my eyes focused on Jesus. And the third element of, of racing, which we've already touched on a bit this morning, is, is our, our direction. What is our focus? What is our focus going to be? What is that finish line? Paul says in Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despised the shame, yeah. and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This scripture has been on my mind for, for months now. We have to look at the life of Jesus here, and we, we can see that he did not want the cross. Mm -hmm. In Luke 22 and 41, we read, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, <laughs> yes. take this cup away from me. Yeah. Thank you. Nevertheless, not my will, but, but thine be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This passage here highlights this prayer that Jesus prayed. Take this cup away from me. And then we read that he was in agony. And he was sweating profusely. Sweat like great drops of blood. This was a man who did not want to die. He did not want to suffer. And far too often we overlook the fact that, that Jesus 
Jesus, although he was a willing sacrifice, he did not fight the cross when it came. He despised the cross. He despised that shame. The cross was not a dream come true for Jesus. It was a nightmare. In Matthew 16 and 21, Jesus speaks of his death. And Peter responds by saying, it's never going to happen to you. And Jesus' response was, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Satan was trying to distract Jesus, trying to pull him away from the ultimate victory of the cross. And Jesus would not have responded in such a direct manner to Peter if it's what Peter was saying was not hitting home for Jesus. Jesus listened to Peter's words and he maybe he thought to himself for a second, maybe I don't have to go through this. Maybe, maybe I don't have to go through all this. Maybe, maybe I'm not the guy for this. Jesus did not want to die on the cross. Our text passage says that he despised the shame. He hated what he went through. But he endured the cross. Why? Because there was a joy set before him. Yeah. Jesus knew the ultimate prize was on the other side of the cross. He knew he would be sat down in the power of God. He knew that all authority under heaven and earth would be given unto him. And so Jesus said to himself, I'm looking to the finish line. I've got my eyes on the prize. I'm going to endure this. I'm racing for a reward. I'm in this for the long haul. I'm enduring to the end. And no, it isn't comfortable. And no, it isn't what I want. But not my will be done. Yes. Well, your will be done. Yes. And Paul says that we are to look unto Jesus, yes. the author and finisher of our faith. In 1 Corinthians, he says, I run not with uncertainty. I fight not as one who beats the air. Paul is saying, I've got a direction. I've got, I've got an aim in my life. I'm not just shadow boxing. I, I'm, I'm hitting something. I, I'm aiming towards something. I've got a direction. I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. We've got to be so careful, church, that we don't confuse movement with progress. Mm-hmm. Just because you're moving doesn't mean you're getting closer to the finish line. Right. Just because you feel busy does not mean you are accomplishing. Right. I could go outside with a shovel out, out here at the church and just dig a hole in the ground all day. And, and I have a huge pile of dirt next to me. And I, I'd be sweating and I'd be tired. But if it wasn't for any reason, right. I haven't accomplished anything. Exactly. I've just got a hole in the ground. And there has to be some direction in your life. There has to be some focus. When we go out there on the job site, we're not just a bunch of guys with hammers just, just hitting random things. We've got some direction of what we're doing. Wayne comes and he gives us a bit of a plan. And, and Perry gives some direction. And, and Pastor gives some direction. We've got a plan when we go out there. We're not just making ourselves busy doing nothing. And you can fool yourself into thinking your walk with God, that you're accomplishing something for God because, wow, I'm really tired at the end of service. Wow, look at me go. I made it out to church this morning, and I feel exhausted. What a job well done. Time for my Sunday nap. I'm telling somebody here today, set a focus in your life. Set specific goals for yourself. I want to get X amount of people to church this year. I want to teach a home Bible study this year. I want to help teach Sunday school. I want to see the fruit of the Spirit in my life. And then don't just set those goals, but make them happen. And the number one overarching, overarching goal in your life has to be, I'm looking towards Jesus. Yeah. I'm pursuing Jesus. Yeah. I'm looking to that example and trying to obtain that perfection. Right. I can tell you as a runner that one of the best tactics to stay engaged is to set many goals. I'd often <laughs> say to myself in a race or a long training run, I've just got to make it until that tree. Mm-hmm. And then I'd reach the tree and I'd say, I've just got to dig down and make it to the stop sign. And then after I pass the stop sign, I've just got to make it until that bush. And those short-term goals are what keep you moving forward. You know, so often we set these huge goals for ourselves, not just as Christians, but just in our lives in general. And then we have no action plan of getting there. In just a couple weeks, we're gonna, people are going to start making New Year's resolutions. They're going to say, I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year. And they have no game plan of how they're going to do that. And maybe they'll even buy a gym membership and they'll go for a couple weeks. And then they, they fade out after a couple weeks. But you've got to have mini goals. You've got to have these small goals that you set for yourself. Okay, I'm going to lose five pounds this month. And then, and then you do everything you can to lose five pounds. And then you set another goal after that. And then another goal after that. And that way, that large and intimidating goal, that goal that you feel like you can never reach, it doesn't become as large and intimidating. Right. You can't just say to yourself, okay, I've never prayed before, but I'm going to start praying an hour every single day. Yeah. It's not going to work. You might get it one or two days. And if you're able to do it consistently after that, props to you. But instead, if you look at your day and say, okay, this is when I'm going to schedule my prayer. Mm-hmm. Not, not an hour at a, at a time, first of all. But first of all, here's a 10-minute window I have in the morning. 
And for a month, I'm going to pray 10 minutes a day. Then after a month, maybe I'll try 20 minutes. And then, then after that month, I'm going, to, I'm going to start going up to half an hour. And I'm going to use that time before bed that I normally spend watching Netflix. And instead, I'm going to devote that to prayer. And you change your behaviors little by little. Or maybe you're trying to overcome sin in your life. Don't just say one day, all right, I'm done with alcoholism forever. But instead, say to yourself, all right, when do I typically drink? Who do I typically drink with? Yeah. What, what, am I, what did my day look like before I do that thing? And, and how do I change those behaviors? How do, how do I move towards the, that goal? Don't just say one big prayer saying, God, set me free from this be forever. But every day, get up and say, Lord, help me to get through this day. Yes. Help me today to keep my mind set on you. Help me today to keep my eyes on the prize. Take it day by day, constantly keeping your direction. Yes. Focus yes. forwards. And trust me when I tell you that as you begin to think on the future, think on the next milestone in your life, think on your eternal reward, you're going to find that motivation to keep running this race. Right. You know, our, our world doesn't really think past the here and now. No. If you look around in society, nobody is thinking past tomorrow. And, and for those who are thinking past tomorrow, there's not certainly, they're certainly not thinking past this life. We, we talked about this the other week at campus ministry. Christians are just about the only people in this world that are considering eternity. Right. They're thinking past the 75 to 80 years that we have on this planet. The, the only people who are thinking about their actions have, who have eternal consequences, it, it's Christians who are thinking about that. And the other week at, at Campus Life, we talked about a specific story that I think is important to talk about. Hebrews 12, 15 to 17. It says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, causing trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Yeah. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. Now this passage is amazing here because Paul in the same passage talking about this race, he references back to Esau. And he says, Esau, Esau came in after a weary day of working in the field and his younger, younger brother Jacob was, was making some food. And Esau being hungry, he approached his brother and asked him for the stew and Jacob told him, give me your birthright and I'll give you some stew. And Esau, Esau, he gave away his birthright. Yeah. Yeah. He gave away his, his blessing as the firstborn son for a bowl of soup. For Esau's sake, I sure hope it was some good soup. Yeah. But here Paul relates the race that we run, the endurance that we are to have to the story of Esau. And he says, beware that you don't give up your reward because of a fleeting pleasure. Yeah. Paul recognizes there will come a day when you will look back retrospectively on your life and you're going to say, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I hadn't have, have gave up that reward for just that instant gratification. I, I wish that I could have gone through a bit more discomfort. I wish that I could have just, you know, buckled down and I could have made it. I was so close to the finish line. But instead, I gratified my flesh in an instant and gave away my heavenly reward. And church, know that there are blessings on the other side of your discomfort. But you've got to go through a bit more to get them. Esau foolishly looked at his momentary discomfort. And decided it was worth giving up his greatest blessing just so he could get comfortable in the moment. Mm -hmm. Esau wasn't thinking of the finish line. Nope. He wasn't thinking past the present moment. He was locked in on the here and now and it cost him out on a very great reward. There's victory on the other side of the battle. Yes. There's a prize at the end of the race. But don't wander aimlessly about. Don't lose sight of what God has for you because you're low on energy. Don't say to yourself, well, my legs are sore, so I deserve a break. We're in a race right now, and you've got to look to the next milestone. You've got to keep Amen. running. You've got to run with endurance the race that is set before you. And let me tell you, it's going to be worth it yes, all. Hallelujah. Some beautiful, happy day. I know you can't see it right now. I know all you can see right now is, is the roller coaster of life and that reward. It feels so distant. But let me tell you, that weight on your shoulders, you can lay it down today. Yeah. And you can begin this race. You can keep running. Maybe you need a refreshing in the presence of God this morning. He's going to give you the strength to finish this race. Thank you, Jesus. If the music could come back this morning. In Matthew 24, 3 to 13, we read, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and says to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. 
and see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Right. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. And many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Anybody else seeing that in our world today? Yeah. The love of many is growing cold. We're seeing these signs in our world today. But then Jesus says, but he who endures to yes. end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Anybody seeing the signs of the times in our world today? We're seeing the famines, the pestilences, the earthquakes. The love of many is growing cold. We're seeing the finish line. And I came here to tell someone today, keep up the fight. Right. Keep enduring. Yes. Keep preaching the gospel to the world. If we could all stand in the presence of God this morning. Someone this morning is going to begin their race. Someone's going to be refreshed in the presence of God. Maybe you find yourself this morning as someone who hasn't yet begun the journey to heaven. I'm inviting you, lay down your burdens at the feet of Jesus. And you'll be filled with the strength to get started. Jesus said that his yoke is easy. His burden is light. The feeling of freedom that you feel is unlike anything else. Or maybe you've been in the church for a long time. And you're feeling the pressure of the world. You're seeing the distractions. Today is the day to have your joy renewed. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all lift our hands. Let's all look at, unto Jesus.